Um, Councillor Drapkin will, if she's not with us right now, at some point she. She's on the phone. Okay, Remy's on the phone right now, so she's uh, with us uh, via the phone. Um, and so uh, we've asked um, Zach to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> That takes us to the point in our agenda this evening for invitation for public comment. And have we had anything turned in this evening? Anyone uh, wanting to do public comment? Seeing none, uh, that will take us to our presentations this evening then. Uh, our first presentation is going to be City Archive presentation. We'll invite uh, Rebecca to come up and present. Rebecca? Thank you, Mayor, okay. Councillors. I recently had the privilege of going down Could to you our... Pull your mic just a little closer. Yeah, just bring it. There you go. I had the privilege of going into our city vault and looking at some of our city archives. And I was so impressed that I wanted to share with you all um, what I found. So I made a short video. And Kylie, if you'll get the lights, I'll start playing it.
So this is uh, eight minutes of uh, what it's been like to work with Rebecca part-time over the last several <laughs> months. She has been a joy. Uh, she's added a lot of interest and richness uh, to those of us who've had the opportunity to work with her over these last few months. Um, you see Claudia Cisnero sitting with you tonight at her first council meeting as our new city recorder. And so we'll be saying goodbye to Rebecca as the interim city recorder. Uh, she's gonna help us out in a few more ways here and there. And so you still may see Rebecca, maybe not at a council meeting, but maybe around city hall. So I just wanted to give my personal thanks to Rebecca and uh, thank her for the opportunity to work with her these last few months. Thank you, Jeff. And Rebecca, from my perspective, you know, we've, uh, um, been able to continue without missing a beat. Uh, you have truly uh, stepped in at a critical time to help us. And the things that our city recorder does are, are seen, and they really are. And so with that tonight, what we'd like to do is uh, uh, I'll come down and, uh, and I'd just like to give you a little a token of our appreciation and also a card. Uh, the one thing I would like to say about your presentation though, um, you know, we talk about the legacy, we talk about the heritage, which is ours, but to see it in color or black and white, whatever it may be, and know that those records are there and that uh, the livability of this community, uh, who we are, did not happen by happenstance. It's people that care and work hard, much like those that are sitting at the dais today and those that have gone before us. We cannot forget to go back into our records and look at the history. You know, eight minutes gave us tremendous joy this evening, just looking at pictures and the stories that are told. I mean, if we emerged ourselves in some of that, we could spend hours and months and years and seeing what had happened. So again, thank you and those that were a part of that project uh, to bringing that, because it, it hits the heart really hard. So uh, thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Also say that as Rebecca has been working her way through a lot of these documents, we found a few that we think are suitable for framing and display. Uh, there is an original plat of the McMinnville Airport that will be hanging in the mayor's office relatively soon. And we also found a plat map of a few square blocks uh, close to downtown that Heather Richards has asked to be displayed in the Community Development Center. And there'll be a few more pieces that pop up around the city as well. Thank you. Uh, we're going to continue with our presentations tonight and the annual presentation of the Planning Commission. And so I'll invite Heather Richards to present. I know I saw Roger um, out in the audience. There's Roger, our chair of the Planning Commission. I've seen a, a number of other individuals on the Planning Commission that are here. So um, Planning Commission does so very much for the council. Um, they work very hard. Uh, on, on the land issue that are so technical in nature. And so uh, looking forward to this uh, report this evening. Heather? So good evening, Mayor and Councilors. We don't have a fancy video with nice soothing music, so I apologize. Well, then that'll lead up to song and dance, right? Oh, I think we should do that in the future for our presentations. Lori wants to sing and dance. Oh, okay. Anyways, uh, so Roger Hall, who is the chair of our Planning Commission, and Lori Shanshay, who is the vice chair of our Planning Commission, are here tonight as well. And this is our annual report, report to you. This has become a tradition. I think this is our third annual report, May. Maybe, I can't recall. Um, I know we've done it in 17, 18, and 19. I can't recall if we did it in 16. But it's really to let you know the work that the Planning Commission is doing. And, and it's actually a gr great segue after the video we saw because they are doing a lot of hard work for the city and on behalf of the city as a volunteer uh, committee. There's nine members, uh, two from each ward, three at large. Uh, the three at large can include people who live in the UGB that aren't within the city limits yet. 
Uh, there's a cross section of citizens. So what I really enjoy about the Planning Commission, which is similar to the City Council here, is that it's, it has a mix of generations on it. It has a mix of genders on it. It has a mix of people who have lived here for a long time and people who just recently moved here. So all different perspectives. Um, we provided in the annual report to you some of the backgrounds for the people who are serving on the, on the Planning Commission. And if you look through that, there is a lot of impressive background serving the community in that role. Um, this is a picture of the nine of them at work. So the, the, it is one of it is our largest actually quasi judicial committee that we have working for the city. Um, <clears throat> we are going to lose this year Martin Kraus Mason, who's been on the city council. What did he say? Seventeen years. I can't recall, but a long time. He's a long-standing member. He is retiring. His wife has retired, and they're now going to travel. We tried to convince him to stay at the last meeting, um, but he's pretty resolute in that. And then Christopher Knapp is also going to be leaving us from the Planning Commission and going to the Historic Landmarks Committee. He is, if you look at his bio, a preservation carpenter that um, trained under one of the best preservation carpentry programs uh, in the United States in Massachusetts. So um, the responsibilities, I like to remind people what the responsibilities for the Planning Commission in, cause, is because it's, uh, it's much broader than what most people think it is. It's to plan for growth and development in an orderly fashion with adequate resources for housing, business, industry, transportation, recreation, culture, comfort, health, and welfare of McMinnville residents so that residents and businesses enjoy a high quality of life. They are advisory to city council and they're also a quasi-judicial decision-making body, meaning that they're making legal decisions for the city. One of the responsibilities is to be a citizen involvement committee. In, this, in the past calendar year, they hosted 18 public hearings. So you've been through a public hearings yourself, a couple of times yourselves as a body. Imagine doing that 18 times over the course of the year. It's actually been, when I went through the record of what they've done the past year, there's been a lot of work there. This is um, a, a picture from one of our hearings from the Oak Ridge Meadows project. It's a little unusual to have it, the house packed like this, but it does happen, I, I would bet, about 50% of the time in terms of the public hearings that are rolling through the, the Planning Commission. Um, they've been working on a work plan uh, for long-range planning based on an assessment that um, I was asked to do when I first got here in 2016. So if you recall, I spent six months going through the planning program, identifying uh, where the needs were, where we may have some outdated plans. We had a lot of outdated plans. Um, what mandates we weren't meeting from the state, from the federal um, government, and what would be some recommendations for strategic planning as well. And then from that, we put together a work plan, a five-year work plan that was adopted in 2017. That five-year work plan we put together with the Planning Commission and City Council it is comprised of long-range planning projects, comprehensive plan amendments, and zoning ordinance amendments. And that's what we've been using since then as we work through each calendar year with the Planning Commission on those types of projects that we're initiating from the city. We fund that work plan with grants, um, with academic partners, and with in-house support. So in the five-year work plan, we're kind of sitting in the middle here of the 2017-19 period and the 2019-2021. Most of these long-range planning efforts don't fit neatly into a 12-month period, so they often um, will straddle a two-year period as we work through them. This is a slide I provided to you last year about what happened in 2018 with the Planning Commission, and we called it setting the table. There was a lot of focus on long-range planning. There was a lot of focus on data, data gathering, citizen engagement, uh, putting, starting the effort on some specialty plans, uh, doing a lot of development code text amendments, and looking at some what we call quirky infill development, nibbling around the edges. And to me, uh, in 2019, we're still doing the same thing, but people have actually come to the table in terms of the current planning process. And we went, the Planning Commission went through a lot of plan development amendments. So those are large development projects which were responding to housing need in the community. So what does that mean? The Planning Commission uh, reviewed and considered 27 different land use applications in the past calendar year. The previous year, they reviewed three. 
So that shows a difference in terms of the work they were doing. Um, the current planning is applying the, the development code and the comprehensive plan to land use applications as they come in, are reviewing them to see if they meet, meet those codes. Some of them are recommendations to U.S. City Council, and some of them are final decisions of the Planning Commission unless appealed to the City Council. But it's remarkable how many of these they actually went through in the past year. What does that look like in terms of the numbers? Um, they're pretty big ones, actually, if you look at the numbers here. So uh, a plan development is PD, and a plan development amendment is um, PDA. Those are large master planning projects. A comprehensive plan amendment is a CPA. That's a pretty significant change in a land use process. Uh, SUB is a subdivision, and a zone change is SZZ. So some large weighty development proposals that have come through the Planning Commission for review this past year. What did that do? It set up the pipeline for 667 dwelling units. Um, in the 667 dwell, that's a lot. <laughs> Remarkable, right? In that 667 dwelling units, 225 of them are multifamily, 19 of them are townhomes, 270 of them are single family dwelling units, and 153 of them are what we call small lot single family dwelling units. So when we talk about the need for a variety of housing and missing middle housing as we move forward in this community, what the Planning Commission has done in this past year is really sort of set the stage for that in terms of the pipeline that they've been working on and improving through their process. Now this isn't 600, there are people nervous about the development occurring in this community and I just wanna make sure people understand these are approved land use decisions. It does not mean 667 dwelling unit permits have been issued and will be built over the next year. These are you know projects that will be built over a, a long period of time, some of them being 10 years, some of them being five years. Heather, I'm sorry, what was the acronym TH in that previous slide? Townhome. Thank you. Townhomes don't do really well in McMinnville. We talked to developers about them, that um, they struggle with selling them and they end up being rentals in their program management and, and don't do well there either. And so um, it is, hasn't been a popular project, although we continue to talk to people. Townhome about being like a common wall. Yep, two. yep. Some of the projects that went through Planning Commission, uh, Shegwin Village came through with a subdivision for a small lot subdivision. So the Rudins will be building this as the last phase of Shegwin Village. And this will be um, homes on lots of about 2,700 square feet. That's the average. There's only four lots there. They're all the corner lots that are over 3,000 square feet. So these will be the smallest lots we have in McMinnville thus far. The frontage of these lots will be 30 feet, which is also the smallest that we have had thus far. And these are, and the Rudins are looking at building homes that are sitting somewhere between, um, they're still working it out, but I think somewhere between 900 and 1,200 square feet for these products and it's really to respond to people who don't need a lot of room in their structure in their home but want to own a place to live um, and it's meant to bring in more affordability. So we're excited to see that come online. Oak Ridge Metals, which you're familiar with, um, was 108 lots. And in the end, uh, the decision as it came through the city council was to remove some lots that were in the floodplain and that then added 10 townhomes to that project. Uh, we also, um, with the uh, Planning Commission approved a mem memory care center in the Three Mile Lane area on Northeast Dunn Place for 44 residential beds. But with all the long range planning that we're underway with now, right, in the specialty planning, we're also talking about what are the other needs as these projects come through and the Planning Commission is participating in all those project advisory committees, so they're bringing that to their discussions and we were able to work with the developer and plan for a future trail system as it's being identified in the three mile lane area planning process on this project. Um, there was also a um, amendment to a plan development to open up a, a piece of property that's there behind Comfort Suites that had been identified to, be, to allow apartments as well as commercial development, but only apartments for seniors. Um, I think that was based on the transportation infrastructure at the time. So a developer came in and said, can we change that and make it multifamily? Um, and so that went through the Planning Commission and was approved. This is a developer that builds multifamily throughout the valley. They're building the project 
project on Evans Street. Um, and the team that's working with them, the building team that's working with them right now speak very, very highly of them. They've been a very great, they've been a great team to work with in terms of going through the process. And then just last week, the Planning Commission went through Baker Creek North and um, recommended those six land use decisions for you as City Council to consider moving forward. This is 400 of the units that are in that 667 unit count. Uh, this has 280 uh, lots in it. Uh, about 100 of them are smaller lots and then it also has 120 multifamily units in the commercial area. In terms of long range planning, um, the, we've been working on about six long range planning projects this year as compared to last year that was 10. Uh, some of them are carrying over from the previous year and, and being wrapped up. So one of the first ones that was wrapped up this calendar year was the Great Neighborhood Principles, which was actually amendments to our comprehensive plan. It was in preparation for our growing McMinnville mindfully discussion, which is what do we want neighborhoods to look like in McMinnville as we continue to grow. And it has sort of the baker's dozen uh, principles for great neighborhoods. And the Planning Commission, um, we haven't had a large project come in under these principles yet. We're excited to see that happen so that we can apply them. But we have been looking at projects as they come through to see if they're meeting the principles and what we can do to work with the developers to get them there if they're not. Um, we also amended the comp plan in terms of what we call goal five in the Oregon land use system, but for historic resources. So we amended a, um, a lot of the policies relative to historic resources uh, to make it concurrent with what was happening at the state. The state went through rulemaking and then adopted a historic preservation plan as an amendment to the comprehensive plan. Um, and this is descriptive of what's in there. That will set the stage for our historic preservation program moving forward. The Planning Commission has been working on and recommended this up the chain to you as a city council, an innovative housing pilot um, project floating zone. This came out of the Affordable Housing Task Force. And this is to look at how to respond to emergency housing needs in this community. Um, it's been a tough discussion. The Planning Commission hosted, it was a legislative initiative. The Planning Commission hosted a couple public hearings and make a re recommendation to the city council. We heard from the industrial stakeholders that they feel they hadn't been engaged enough, so we've been um, trying to host open houses to engage them and have a discussion before it, before it comes to City Council. This will be uh, considered tomorrow, the Affordable Housing Task Force, as to when to schedule it into you as the City Council body. Um, but it's looking at a floating zone over the industrial area where we do have land supply uh, to respond to those housing needs. The Planning Commission has also been involved in the housing strategy and housing needs report that just got finished this year and shows our billable land inventory and then what our need is in terms of future growth with uh, housing and population assumption. Uh, you can see there, interestingly, this map's kind of hard to see. But if we killed the pendant lights, it'd be a lot easier. <laughs> I tell Claudia if we could. <laughs> um, but anyways, if you see there, if you look up in the northwest corner um, where you see a lot of orange without hash marks, hash marks show that it's constrained land and is not readily developable. That's all vacant land according to our buildables land inventory because we started, we, we sh shut down the clock January 2019 as our cutoff date for this. Those are all the lands that went through the Planning Commission in this past year for land, um, land use approvals. So we're really at the end of our large tracts of land for land use approvals at this point in time within the city limits. We are currently underway with the economic opportunity analysis, updating the 2013 one so that dovetails with the new economic development strategic land. We're also looking at public land needs as well. So what happens is within that work plan, um, we have all these long range planning projects. We set up project advisory committees and then three planning commissioners sit on each of those. And they provide sort of the bridge between planning commission and those project advisory committees for those discussions. And then we will come in 
to the Planning Commission and have work sessions um, every three or four months on what's occurring within those project advisory committees so that everyone's sort of tracking the same. Planning Commission works uh, meets as a work session an hour before their regular business meeting. Uh, we asked them to do that when we adopted the work plan because we knew it was going to be a lot of work that we needed to get through and we wanted to be able to have more time with the Planning Commission to do that. So they've been doing that with us and we really appreciate that. This is the buildable lands inventory map in draft form for our employment lands. Anything in color is considered developable and everything in white is um, not developable, already built out. So the three mile lane is another specialty area plan that's been underway um, and we're about halfway through that. What will come from this is comprehensive plan policy amendments, um, legislative zoning initiatives, uh, TSP amendments. There will be all sorts of different planning initiatives that will come from this process that will go through the planning commission into you as city council. In terms of next year, what we're looking at, as I said, we've been focusing on this sort of bracket right here over the past year. These are all the things we've accomplished. So those are all booked, so to speak. I always think they're, I always call them booked once they've had a final decision on them. Um, and so that's a lot of work that the Planning Commission has done in the last year and a half. These are all the things we're currently working on. So we've been able to maintain this work plan since 2017 and, and moving it forward. Now as we look to the future, we're gonna to look to the next two brackets and start working through those. We are gonna move, we just learned about two weeks ago, I haven't shared this with the Planning Commission yet, or actually even my boss, um, but we learned that our uh, population forecast, which is meant to last for four years and was done in 2017, will actually be updated in 2020. Because the land use process is so easy to get through in four years, the state decided to make it a three year window instead of a four-year window. <laughs> so we are now looking at how do we move up that process in terms of uh, uh, thinking about land needs and housing needs within our current population forecast because we don't want to reinvest in all that effort again. <clears throat> and then we also have House Bill 2001, which we'll be rolling through the Planning Commission um, in terms of some development code amendments and natural resources mapping. So because of the things that have been added to 2019, 2021, we are shifting um, our recommendations for some of the airport associated work um, to dovetail that with the airport master planning process a little bit better. And then um, we've had discussions with Linfield about a university zone. They haven't been that interested thus far, but they're in their master planning right now. So we suspect they might be down the road. So our new work plan looks like this. Um, it's a lot less of the development code amendments that you see there that was sort of setting the table in the 2017 era and now we're sort of tackling the big um, long range planning projects and focusing on the growth discussions. So you saw this, thank you Rebecca for that great segue. Um, we have a growing McMinnville Mindfully program that we're working on with the Planning Commission and it's all about how does McMinnville grow into the future but in a very mindful way. Um, this is a discussion of what we need to be planning for to 2041 and 2067 <clears throat> and what it means in terms of homes that we need to accommodate. Um, the types of housing needs we have in terms of the uh, income levels that we need to serve. So this gets back to that pipeline I talked about of all the different types of housing that we're looking at uh, because we're supposed to be plugging into these different needs that have been identified in our community. And just to point out some things, 41% of our future homes are considered to be mid-level executive homes uh, for people making greater than 120% of area median income. So there is a need for that. Um, but we also have another 40% of our future homes which are less than, um, for people who are making less than 80% of area median income, which is low and moderate income. So that's, that's the affordable subsidized housing as well as workforce housing. So right now we just put these out <clears throat> last night, I think, over at the community center. We're starting and we'll put them in the library too. We're starting to collect information from the community about what they love about McMinnville and what their ideas are for the future. And then our discussion of should we grow up, out, or a little bit of both. 
So it's a lot of work. Um, we see it as a team with the Planning Commission. We couldn't do this work without the Planning Commission and their effort and the hours that they put in for what they do. Um, and we really see ourselves as supporting them. So this, our role as staff is to support the Planning Commission in the work that they do. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is a picture of our two newest staff members in doing that. And uh, I wanted to give Roger and Lori an opportunity if they wanted to share their thoughts as the chair and vice chair. Roger's been the chair, I think, for three years, right? Two? Oh, two it years. Seems like forever. Next year will be three years. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys wanted to say anything. Uh, a little earlier in her presentation, Heather mentioned the uh, what I consider a really nice feature of the, this particular planning commission, and as the range of um, types of people, personalities, backgrounds, focus, interests, uh, you have provided us with a really nice group of people to work with. Um, she also mentioned that two of our current members are about to retire or move to other uh, assignments. Um, and that being the case, I just want to uh, follow up on what I said last year by asking you to provide us two more people like that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Oh, no. Oh, all right. Well. Okay. So we stand for questions. If you have any, that's the end of our presentation. So we'll open the dais up for questions. Any questions, comments? Again, I, I just, from my perspective, how how much we appreciate uh, the the planning group, the thoughtfulness of of uh, their discussions, deliberations, and reports to us makes our job so much easier. We've had some heavy lifting this year, as Heather indicated, and uh, and your thoughtfulness and. I think the effective way that you've done what you needed to do has helped us tremendously. So, uh, Roger, if you can take that back to the the, the total uh, commissioners, and we will uh, we we have put our heads together on individuals that were even going out and knocking on not <clears throat> specific doors and asking people possibly to to join our uh, planning commission. So we're uh, diligently working towards that. Again, thank you, and uh, and uh, the uh, the planning group uh, as a total, because we all work together uh, from from that perspective. So thank you. Yeah, Mayor, if I can add, we do, it is just, to, just to make sure everyone understands, we do have two openings on this fabulous commission that people can participate yeah. on. <laughs> um, one would be for an at-large uh, position, so that's anybody who lives within the city as well as within the UGB, and then one is a position in Ward 1. Um, but for anybody who's interested in really being able to make meaningful impact on the future of McMinnville, this is a great commission to sit on in that regard because you are at the front line of uh, growth and development here. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, we'll move over to advice and information items, and we'll start with reports from councilors on committee and board and board assignments. Sal, we'll start with you this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have one really quick note. The main item of business at the Council of Governments that related to McMinnville is to congratulate you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for being part of the group that got the approval to start the purchasing of land for the next phase of the bypass. That's a huge deal, and it took up a big portion of our meeting at the Council of Governments, so congratulations to you and the uh, members of the legislative delegation that came and got that funding. That was uh, that was a that was fun. <laughs> yeah, the, the new OTC uh, is a dynamic group that's very open to listening, and our new director of ODOT is a, a guy I think that's going to bring a, a, a little more fire and, and moving forward from that perspective. Yeah. Well, I think you and and uh, Dave Hogeberg in particular deserve a lot of credit for uh, for making that funding um, happen. That's millions and millions of dollars, and it's a big deal for our community. So. I hope that that is recognized. Um, I just want to touch on a couple of things because this is our last meeting before the new year. Um, 
And mostly this is with an eye towards the budgeting process that's gonna start immediately after we get back. Um, I feel like 2019 was a year that saw our state become the second leading state in the country for homelessness. And our rural region is the number one region in the country for unsheltered homelessness uh, rurally. And I feel like we made a fair amount of progress in terms of dealing with unlawful long-term camping. I think since I've been on the council, we've probably passed 10 different ordinances to deal with different aspects of negative behaviors to give the police greater authority to address those behaviors. Um, it's my hope that in 2020, we also created a revenue stream in 2019 to deal with homelessness. So it's my hope in 2020 that we can actually start to do some of the work, the hard work in, in terms of addressing those impacts in our city. I, I, um, I really feel like we should be taking a deep dive into how we deal with mentally ill people on our streets and looking for more services to try and address some of the bigger problems that we're seeing in that area. And, and I know it's a really challenging issue, but I really hope that we take some definitive action towards that. And I mentioned this in the, uh, the previous session tonight, but I really feel like we need to take more definitive action to address the staffing shortfall at fire and EMS. Uh, and maybe as part of that, you know, we also consider wrapping in funding for police for the increased need to deal with the homelessness situation. And I'm not saying this by way of giving any particular direction, but I really would hope that we're gonna take a big uh, look at that. And then the other thing, much smaller, um, and this relates more to Parks and Susan's department, um, I really hope that we will leverage city resources with the OWEB grant program to do more work on the Cozine uh, this year in terms of that restoration around city parks. So those are just two things I wanted people to be thinking about heading into the next year. Thank you, Sal. Uh, let's go to Adam. Uh, YCOM's meeting would normally be Thursday, but it got moved up today, um, which I wasn't able to make because of prior arrangements. Uh, a few weeks ago, the mayor and Mike and I held interviews for airport commission. Uh, we had uh, five great candidates, and one of those is in your packet tonight, and he's in the crowd as well. So welcome. Um, that's exciting to, to turn the page on uh, Jody coming off the airport commission. She brought a lot to the commission, um, but I'm also excited to see what Stephen brings to the commission, and um, he interviewed very well and excited to have him on board. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I'll go to Remy. Uh, Remy, any reports for us this evening? Um, the McMinnville Affordable Housing Task Force will be meeting tomorrow morning um, at uh, 10 a.m. at our, our, our regularly scheduled time. Um, and uh, everybody is uh, invited to attend, and we do still have open positions on that committee as well. Thank you, Remy. Uh, Zach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A historic Landmarks Committee meeting met um, a little while ago. There's no December meeting, but their November meeting, there was some continuous, continued business on the first federal application to review um, if the brick was an acceptable color of black or not an acceptable color of black. And uh, there was some discussion on a project at the Mini Super Hidalgo down here um, near Golden Valley Brewery. So some exciting stuff there. Uh, Landscape Review Committee, I missed. My apologies to Mr. Fleckenstein when you see him. <laughs> McMinnville, so if anyone, if Council President Menke or Mr. Mayor, if you attended, you can take my update there. And then the McMinnville Community Media um, 
meeting I also missed. That one is tough to make on Monday nights. I'm, the, I'm, I'm um, Mr. Dad on that night. So um, my New Year's resolution for 2020 is to make more of those meetings and f adjust my schedules for Hiram so I can make sure to make those. But um, for McMinnville Community Media, the programming is excellent as always. They did, had a successful, uh, successfully live covered the Santa's Parade. Santa made it. And um, they're going to embark on the recently they did some capital improvements in the facility here. They did some capital improvements to their mobile uh, operations van. I'm going to do some capital improvements to their studio itself. And I'm proud also to announce that I'm going to take my talents to the city of McMinnville's cookie competition next week. And I'm going to win. <laughs> I'm going to win the cookie competition. That's it. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Council President Minky. <clears throat> well, I was on vacation last month and uh, missed a few meetings. As uh, Remy says, tomorrow is the affordable housing meeting at 10. Uh, next uh, Wednesday, a week from Wednesday, is uh, the uh, Visit McMinnville meeting. And <clears throat> interesting discussions there. Um, I guess my comment tonight in regard to the uh, housing for the homeless and other things is what we really need is land. I mean, <laughs> you just, it's, it's what we need. We can get state funding. We can get builders to build. We can get just about every other element, but we've got to have land or money to obtain land if it's obtainable. That's the other issue. Sometimes it's just not. So I, I put that out to you. If you know anybody who might have a generous part in their heart that would like to assist in this, I see one gentleman here tonight in particular. Uh, you know, we need land. <laughs> and we need some way that we can, uh, you know, generate housing for the homeless. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, a couple of things that I have this evening. Um, um, Sal had mentioned that uh, we had an opportunity to meet, um, well, on, on th three times with the uh, OTC. Um, two months ago, we went down to Liddell's, uh, drove five hours for 15 minutes to speak to them, but we set the tone. Um, uh, th three weeks ago, we had an opportunity to have a group from um, Newburgh Dundee uh, uh, bypass committee address the OTC, and then with my role on uh, MWAC, which is the Willamette Valley uh, Transportation Advisory Committee to the OTC, we made a presentation uh, to uh, uh, the OTC, and the OTC is the Oregon Transportation Committee, and they're the ones that make the heavy lifting, the decisions uh, for the Department of uh, of uh, transportation and the MWAC, their number one priority was the bypass. And we talked about um, truly the impact that not having the bypass go all the way through is having on Marion County going across on McKay Road. Uh, seven deaths uh, in, uh, in eight months on that road. Uh, I'll tell you, um, uh, Google Maps now is taking you down McKay Road, okay? That has not been the case until probably two months ago. Um, uh, they'll take you anywhere, but now it's taking you all the way down to McKay Road, and people are following Google Maps, and it is just, it's amazing. And so some things do need to happen from that perspective. And so a lot of interested individuals, but it's amazing when you can bring all the constituents uh, or the counties together and, and have a loud message, uh, they're starting to listen. And the impacts, um, I think, are going to be uh, uh, forthcoming from that perspective. Um, on your dais this evening, there's a book, uh, How to Be a Great Boss. And, and those are your copies. Um, let me share some things that have been happening um, uh, over the last couple of months. Um, uh, Wendy Stassen and, and uh, Council President uh, Mankey and myself have been meeting, and we're trying to put together 
what our dinner meetings are going to look like, to build unity and cohesiveness, but more importantly, to have a form where we can tell uh, our our group about what our concerns are and talk at a more um, specific um, direction and have better dialogue uh, as a group. And so we have made a determination that starting in 2020, uh, we are going to take our second work session or the second, uh, uh, the, it'll be our second meeting of the month, the fourth Tuesday night, that work session is going to be our dinner. And that's going to have an opportunity for us to, to bond a little more as a council. But we are going to give you an assignment, and that's to read How to Be a Great Boss. And it's a, a program called Traction that is being used by many uh, companies to uh, have more accountability, more uh, direction, more uh, scorecard types of things so that we can really track where we're going to go. And uh, I've given that assignment to Wendy. She's running that for her her, uh, her company, and she's having great success with that, and so we're going to be bringing that on board. More to come, but that's why you have uh, how to be a great boss at your desk, and it's an easy read, but I think it'll give us an oversight of some principles that will get us where we need to go. Um, from another perspective, um, Mac Water and Light, um, we have a, an opening this year, one of our commissioners has decided uh, not to renew their uh, opportunity to serve on the commission. Uh, Nancy uh, Carlton, um, they're going to start traveling more. And she and Mark, uh, she just feels like they're doing so much traveling that they, she can't be effective on the commission. So I've been working over the last two months since Nancy indicated that to me. And tonight I have a uh, a recommendation to the council. Uh, again, any time that we have an opening on McMinnville Water and Light as a commissioner, uh, I bring the name to the council. The council will approve that, and then I'll take that back to Water and Light, and we will ratify that there and, and move forward. So tonight, a, an individual that you all are very aware of, but Jody Christensen I have approached, and she's uh, worked through the powers of B at the state government, and they are going to allow her uh, to, uh, if approved this evening, to step up and be a water and light commissioner. So I will ask for a motion to approve the commission appointment of Jody Christensen uh, to be on the McMinnville Water and Light Commission. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Uh, this, uh, um, this, um, uh, this appointment uh, passes unanimously five to zero. Okay, uh, let's go and uh, to department heads this evening. And so we'll start with the chief and kind of go around. Yeah, real quickly, uh, some updates and uh, a personnel update I want to let you all know about. Um, we have that uh, major radio upgrade project that I've continued to brief you up about. Uh, working with Dave Wireless, we should be online by the end of uh, January, 1st of February, so that's a big deal. That's about ready to wrap up. Uh, this weekend on Sunday, uh, we're happy to report Walmart continues to do, uh, be very generous in the donation to shop with a cop. And this year we'll be um, um, spending time with 67 kids in our community and over 20 uh, Mac PD staff and uh, officers will be out there along with some other uh, smaller agencies uh, working with those families. It's certainly uh, probably the, the, the best time of our year. And, uh, we have the ability to give and um, and uh, provide uh, some uh, some um, good times for those kids. That's a that's a great time. Um, lastly, I wanted to let you all know that uh, Officer Robert Harmon uh, will be retiring at the end of this year. I know we don't have another council session, so I think it's appropriate to bring it here that uh, he's retiring after uh, a little over 25 years with Mac PD. Uh, he served his country proudly for many years as well. And uh, so on the 31st of December, uh, we're going to be wishing him uh, 
a happy retirement as he moves on to the next chapter. So if you uh, are available, I believe it's going to be on the 31st at 3 or 4 o'clock, but I'll, I'll get that information out. But we're certainly uh, really excited for Robert and uh, proud of his work for these many years for the city. Thank you, Chief. Amy, anything from the fire department? Uh, just one thing for everybody. Um, as you were all briefed during executive session tonight, the city of McMinnville has been in litigation along with uh, the city of Newburgh, Yamhill County, and Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue against Metro West um, due to the fact that they had been in violation of our ambulance service area plan. We've come to a resolution along with all of the parties. Um, I've worked with Walt a bit just to make sure that uh, everything looks good. Um, there is no financial impact to this. It's an agreement type of resolution um, and we would recommend that uh, the city manager be authorized to execute the settlement and services agreement. Thank you, Amy. Susan? So, Mayor, can we uh, ask the council to discuss that and take action on that item before we move forward? Uh, and just for the public record, there's a hard copy of the staff report that Amy uh, just presented uh, that will become part of the record. The staff's recommendation is a motion from council authorizing the city manager to execute the settlement and services agreement. So do I have a motion to... Uh, I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And so that moves forward, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Susan. Okay, I uh, just wanted to remind you all, you received a link to the application for what we're calling our Enrichment Services Advisory Committee. So this is the committee that will look at the locational issues and scope for a potential joint facility for the Aquatic Center and Recreation Center. And we've wrapped the library into that and a couple of other city services. So it's open right now. They're coming, two came in tonight during your council meeting. Um, so if anybody's interested, please go to what do you think Mac Dot org um, and fill out the application there. The deadline is Sunday at midnight, uh, so we will be working through the process of screening those applicants, and I know Councilor Garvin is going to be on the interview panel for us on that, and we'll, we'll come back to you. But if you could please circulate um, the link and get people to <laughs> for that, that you are particularly interested in hearing their voice on that committee, that would be great. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Eileen? Nothing. Scott? Jennifer? Larry? I just wanted to be uh, thankful that we're not going to include my photo in any of the archives. <laughs> 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 That's all I got. That was uh, you with the big bushy beard? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Heather? Um, so I do have a um, question for council. It's regarding the public hearing process that we've discussed as uh, that you want to move forward with. It's a little awkward because you don't have another meeting in December, but we, as I shared with you earlier, the Baker Creek North um, land, six land use applications were um, recommended for approval by the Planning Commission last week to the city council. We are working on a 120 day clock. So for me to be able to move forward, if you wanted to do a public hearing, I would need to have that direction tonight so I could make sure I get that notice out. It would be on January 28th, but because of the way the cycle of council meetings are occurring, we would need to know tonight because uh, your next city council will be too late for us to notice it. Um, if you did want to have a public hearing, we could do similar to what we did with Oak Ridge Meadows, where we we come in on January 14th, your first meeting in January, present the ordinances and the recommendation from Planning Commission and the staff report going through the project um, so that we you have that in advance of the public hearing and we don't have to do that lengthy staff report at the public hearing and then do a public hearing on, on the 28th. To let you know what occurred at the Planning Commission level, um, we, we, we didn't get any phone calls about this um, land use proposal moving up into the public hearing process. We did get a letter the day of the day before. We got a letter that evening. Uh, the letter we got the day before was oppositional. The, the letter we got that evening was had a concern about a couple of items. Um, and then there were three people who testified. Um, Two people were, I don't think they were oppositional necessarily. They, they did have concern about a couple of items of the proposal, um, mostly design standards, so they represented that. And then we had one person testify um, that just is, is really nervous about growth and development and wanted 
uh, and nervous about the smaller lots as well. City, uh, the newspaper wrote up an article today and did a great job summarizing the testimony. So that's why the Planning Commission was able to move forward with decision making last week for it. Thank you, Heather. So um, as I turn to the council, any feelings on that? Uh, minimal testimony and input, but uh, what would be, what would be uh, your direction for, for Heather on that? Can you remind me what the expected cost to do the public hearing is? Well, we wouldn't charge for it at this point in time because we don't have that in our fee schedule. Um, I think for, in terms of staff staff time and resources, mm -hmm. and noticing, I think it was $1,700. Uh, I would like to have a public hearing in that split meeting format where you present on the 14th and have the hearing on the 18th. 28th. 28th, yeah. Other input? Mayor, I corresponded with Councillor Stassens as she was traveling today. She indicated that uh, she did not believe we needed a public hearing on this item. Okay. I personally would favor not having a public hearing under the circumstances. I feel like that the, they've had ample opportunity and there was no significant, as far as I can understand, uh, objections. Remy? Um... And it, I, I have to be frank, this part of the conversation going back and forth between the, the, the positions of the voices, it's been pretty hard for me to follow. So um, I'm just, I'm going to refrain and, and hope that I, maybe we can move the phone to the next section so that I can uh, hear everybody's um, commentary a little bit more clearly. Okay, we'll come back to you then. Um, Sal? I don't feel really strongly about it. It seems to me that there's not a huge amount of public support for doing a hearing. Um, if it were like the Oak Ridge Meadows, I would feel strongly that we need to have one, but in this case with just very little testimony and um, seemingly more people in favor than not, I okay. don't think it's necessary. Uh, Zach? <laughs> I'm trying to decide what my metric is for wanting one. Is it? How many people ask for it? If anyone asks for it, is it size of the development regardless of if people are asking for it or not? It feels like it should. So I would I would support and, and gladly go through it to have the process done. Okay. And, and you know, I, I think last time we had this discussion for Oak Ridge, there was another one that came in right underneath it. I think it was the apartment builder out by the theater or across the street so by the airport that mm, nothing no big not a big thing nobody asking for it and we didn't have one and that one just kind of didn't feel like we needed one but it was small enough that i wasn't worried about i don't know so i'm trying to decide i i, I would probably be in favor of it but maybe that's because i can see where i'm losing that battle and i don't know okay. uh remy i'll come back to you and I know how hard it is to follow uh, conversations on the phone. Remy? Uh, yeah, um, thank you. Um, uh, you know, I, I am always supportive of the public hearing process, um, even um, even sometimes uh, I think it can be a, um, a, a challenge to um, to uh, accommodate everybody's voice, but I think the, the public hearing process is an important one, and um, uh, and it's uh, uh, and, and I'm it's, if it's the favor of the council, and I and from the conversation, I really know. <laughs> If, if it's in the interest of um, just kind of breaking a split council, I'll, I'll change my somewhat neutral opposed to a somewhat neutral in favor of having the hearing based on Zach and Remy's comments. Okay. So at this point, we have Adam, we have Sal, we have Zach, and we have Remy. 
So um, I think, Heather, you've got a direction that uh, we go through that process, um, first meeting in um, January and then follow up on the second meeting in January. Yes, and what we will do is um, we'll deliver the binders, there's two of them, to you next week um, so that you get them in advance. They will not have the ordinances in them for, for consideration for January 14th. Those will come at a later date, but you'll at least have the application and the recommendations from Planning Commission so you can review those. Those are all online for the public as well. Uh, Heather, just out of curiosity, do you anticipate any changes at all to the <clears throat> anything, any mitigation or anything like that in view of the fact um, there was almost no testimony? So per, per your code, your city code, what happens is the recommendations from the planning commission, so they recommend a, a decision and findings associated with that decision. Our job as staff is to bring that to you as city council for consideration. So that's what we will do. So this will be the final copy that we get. Uh, it, yes, it could be. There, there was one issue that was being worked through a little bit that may, it, it, much like um, some of our other ones where there's a, a science piece that needs to be resolved, there may be one issue there, but it, actually there wasn't anything that was significant. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Claudia, welcome. It's good to have you here this evening. Rebecca, thank you. I know we'll see you around quite a bit. Um, Walt, do you have anything for us this evening? And Jeff, you do. Uh, thank you, Mayor. One item, uh, over the series of the last several months, the uh, council has had a couple of uh, public meetings and at least one work session to discuss the current contract and future contractual relationship between the city and Visit McMinnville. Uh, you had a work session in September. I've had a series of conversations with uh, both the full board of Visit McMinnville and uh, uh, parts of the board as well as the uh, key staff. Uh, we are jointly bringing together, uh, bringing a proposal to you tonight um, to uh, negotiate a new three-year agreement uh, between the city and Visit McMinnville that would commence on July 1 of 2020 uh, and that as part of that agreement we propose the formation of a task force made up of Visit McMinnville board members and other community uh, stakeholders with economic development backgrounds um, to lead the effort and ultimately make recommendations to the city council about future allocation uh, for transient lodging tax um, dollars. Uh, we would expect expect that uh, there would be uh, the potential to engage consultants and the, uh, the work to bring recommendations forward could take 12 to 18, uh, potentially uh, more months than that. We think it's prudent to negotiate a three-year agreement that gives us time to both define that work, hire consultants, perform and analyze the work and initiate implementation. Uh, the agreement would include provisions uh, for the city and visit McMinnville to budget the necessary resources to conduct the work to provide TLT resources to visit McMinnville to continue its current work plan and to allow the city to set aside resources that could be used to begin the implementation of projects and initiatives that result from the described project. Our proposal is that we would spend the next few months uh, negotiating a successor agreement and designing a detailed project description and charge for the task force that includes a timeline and budget for the project and bring that back to the council for initial consideration and work session in the spring, probably late May March or early April, get some feedback from the council and bring a new agreement along with a budget and work plan for Visit McMinnville to be presented to the council for consideration and adoption in May or June. We have representatives of Visit McMinnville here this evening. They're sitting near the public work seats for those of you who attend a lot of council meetings. Uh, at least two board members and two key staff, oh, I see three board members and two key staff members. Um, I don't know if any of them have specific comments to make tonight. I'd look to Aaron Stevenson to let us know if there are specific comments to be made. Uh, and certainly uh, either I or members of Visit McMinnville can answer any questions that you have. Uh, my suggestion is if uh, this proposal is uh, consistent with the council's interest, you can indicate your consensus and we will move forward to the next step of the process, will be, which would be to begin negotiating a new agreement. So I'll open it up to the dais for questions of, of Jeff. Uh, myself who sit on Visit McMinnville or members of the board and uh, the uh, staff that are here this evening. Uh, I have some comments um, uh, and questions about this. Um, and Jeff, just, just kind of going off what you just said that you felt like this was consistent with um, the direction 
information receiving from uh, counsel, I, I have to say I was shocked when I opened this and read it. Um, it certainly isn't at all reflective of the direction um, that I felt we were moving uh, as a council or as a city. Um, and so I have a, a lot of, um, well, more than pause with um, this recommendation. And um, I would like to have an opportunity here to discuss it um, and talk about uh, some of my, I, I think, very well-founded concerns um, uh, in, with the idea of interrupting um, interrupting this contract, shifting gears, um, bringing in a consultant that would cost, I have no idea how much money, but um, I, I, I would guesstimate anywhere from 30 to, I don't know, 100 or 1,000 or more dollars, um, and also uh, interrupting the work that's happening with an organization that's currently, um, whether or not uh, uh, you like uh, the impact of tourism, it is having a broad, uh, positive economic impact on our area. Um, and the idea of diverting resources uh, from an organization that's creating a lot of economic growth um, not just for our city, but also within our city budget uh, is very um, concerning to me. Uh, I do have um, some things to discuss regarding this other than um, other than clearly not um, being in support of this recommendation. Um, uh, but it's always a little hard to be on the phone, so I apologize that I don't want to, um, I don't want to kind of overtake and lecture. So um, just throwing that out there, I'd like to kind of start um, that conversation. And then I could, if you'll please come back to me and talk about some of the ways in which um, I see that we could move um, if, uh, if that's a, uh, the direction the rest of the council wants to go, um, but um, I am very concerned that we've you know, spent four years working on building an organization that's doing the work, specific work that we asked them to do. They seem to be doing it well, creating more revenue for the city, which we're badly in need of, and that we would suddenly stop that um, instead of uh, taking some other steps, which we could if we want to explore um, other directions for economic vitality. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now, but please do come back to me. Uh, thank you, Remy. Any specific question that you would have that you'd like uh, uh, to be addressed, or do you, you want us to go through our process and again come back to you? Yeah, please, the latter. Okay. I'll open it up to the... So, Mayor, Mayor, could I just let me touch on a couple of things in partial response to uh, the concerns that Remy voiced. I think it's important to understand that this is a joint proposal being made by the Visit McMinnville Board of Directors and city staff. This isn't a city staff uh, driven direction. Uh, we've been trying to work in a collaborative manner to come up with uh, this concept to be responsive to what we've heard from the council uh, over the course of a series of budget conversations and work sessions and I think a key component of this is that we're not ending the relationship with Visit McMinnville. In fact, we're negotiating a new three-year agreement with Visit McMinnville and, and preserving the ability of Visit McMinnville to continue its current good work in economic development. So uh, I, 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 I will apologize if the staff report uh, wasn't clear enough in making uh, clear to members of the council and to others that the valued work of Visit McMinnville will continue continue under this relationship and that we jointly see this as an opportunity after a productive nearly five-year contractual relationships to take another look about uh, how TLT can best serve this community and to continue to drive economic development in the community. And perhaps at this point, maybe I could look to Aaron or other members of Visit McMinnville to um, maybe flesh that out a little bit from their perspective and then turn to members of the council for questions and comments. 
Welcome. Uh, yes, I would have to do that. Well, let me just add that if the information that the Visit McMinnville board has received is that it's the will of the, the council, which is what the, it says here in this uh, in this staff report, um, then it, to me, raises questions about um, you know what what direction if 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 the message is that the council wants to go in a different direction, then as a good partner, that would um, be a you, you know participating in finding other direction would be a, a natural take and uh, uh, yeah. So so please, um, I'd like to hear from Visit McMinnville as well. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and turn uh, some time over to Aaron uh, to address uh, Remy's concern. And uh, I know we had uh, ample opportunity as a board at our last board meeting to 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 talk about that. But Aaron, if you'd uh, address Remy's concern, and then we'll kind of go from there. Certainly, um, we did discuss this at our last board meeting, and um, Visit McMinnville has always. Um, you know, as we stated when we had our work session with council, which we really appreciated, we have always deeply appreciated the open communication uh, between our board of directors and between council and the way in which uh, we've come together as stakeholders and city leaders to create this organization in the, the last four years and uh, due in large part to some exemplary staff, we have become leaders and McMinnville should be very proud that in a very short amount of time, we have become leaders on a statewide level when it comes to tourism and effectively squiring tourism dollars for economic development. And I think that that's something that we can feel great about and should applaud as a community. Um, we are very much interested in being invested in that, that dialogue with council. We had a work session. Uh, we uh, listened to council and concerns um, expressed. We've listened to city staff and um, heard that there is interest in ongoing dialogue about how transient lodging tax dollars are, are used to maximize um, economic development in our community. I think that I was the one who said it, so I'm not gonna quote anybody or speak for the organization, but I, I said when we met in our work session that um, there are no sacred cows. Um, if we went through a, a fantastic process, a very thorough process four years ago to create Visit McMinnville. And, um, but that doesn't mean we can't have an ongoing dialogue and conversation about the most effective ways to spend these dollars within the parameters that are laid out for us within the law. And um, so I think if you asked the Visit McMinnville board based on the information um, and data that we have right now, we feel like we're doing the most effective job humanly possible with these dollars. If council wants to engage with us in a conversation and feels like there's value in spending dollars to investigate other ways that transient lodging tax dollars can be spent towards economic development purposes, we're saying through this process that um, you know, we're, we're of course willing to have that conversation um, and see where that conversation um, leads us. I, um, I think what I hear Remy asking is to some degree, you know, if we had not had that, that feedback from, from staff and the perception of that feedback from council, would we be asking for a renegotiation of our contract right now? No, you know, we wouldn't, but this is a dialogue and a partnership. And if that's the conversation that um, council feels we need to be having and if that's the way in which council feels that we need to um, spend resources to explore other areas of tourism economic development, looking specifically at destination development, which is something that we've begun discussing as a board already. Um, facilities, uh, and business tourism, business recruitment, those were the, the areas um, that were discussed at our board meeting. Remy, did that provide any clarity whatsoever? Or did that muddy the waters? Remy, uh, uh, Aaron asked if that gave some clarity to where the board was coming from. I, I mean, it it does 
sounds for me, I mean, to me, that sounds like this recommendation is a response to direction from council. And I guess what I'm saying is I don't feel like council gave this direction. So I'd be interested in hearing from other members of council. Okay. I, th I think that's wise. So let's open it up to uh, to the council because I think we did have some concerns by a few individuals that, uh, you know, there may be some things that we could in the future be looking towards as it relates to uh, uses of some of those dollars uh, that are in the 70%. So I'll just open it up and see if uh, anyone would like to uh, share some thoughts on that. And so I open it up to the dais. Anyone? Uh, I mean, I'll, or unless you wanted to. Uh -huh. Yeah, so um, this is consistent with what I think we're gonna need to do, whether we do it sooner or later. The contract is expiring in a year either way. So we're gonna have to go through the process of, of renegotiating that contract anyway. This is a little sooner than I would have expected that to happen, but um, I'm, I have no, particular issues as far as starting it now or, or a year from now. Um, in terms of how the transient lodging dollars are spent, I've, I think I've been fairly clear personally that I, although from a marketing standpoint, I think M Visit McMinnville has done uh, above and beyond the call of duty in terms of the effectiveness of how they're using the funds, uh, I also believe that the legislative authority that we have allows us to use those monies on capital projects, and uh, I think we should be considering that use. Um, beyond that, I think that the, um, the mission of Visit McMinnville is to promote travel and tourism into the community that's a very kind of specific approach. Um, I feel like it, as much as it is value, valuable to our community, uh, and it's important that we have a strong tourism presence, um, I also feel like it comes with a cost. And that cost being gentrification, that cost being people who have lived in this community for years can't afford to buy houses here because it becomes such an attractive destination for people of significantly more means. I don't think it should be lost on anyone that the plan that our planning department showed us today, you know, half of the housing demand that we're gonna have in this community based on the numbers, the preliminary things that they put together, about half of those are gonna be upper income. And so I'm just concerned that we're moving so far towards catering to higher end folks, tourism, tourists from out of the community, that we're not doing enough to help folks locally. Um, and because the city budget is a limited budget, um, I think we need to be looking at other areas, other ways to spend trans transient lodging tax dollars within the legislative authority to bolster programs that we have. So this is consistent with the direction that I think we're gonna have to go anyway in another year. It's not a reflection, a negative reflection in any way on Visit McMinnville or their work. It's just a reflection that that's a more limited scope of priorities than I think we have as a city. Uh, Sal, if I may, um, and just to maybe add some clarity here, um, I am not uh, opposed to um, reevaluating the contract, reevaluating the use of TLT dollars. What What's alarming to me is the methodology here of ending a contract early and then reorganizing a budget by, you know, the proposal of already setting aside money with no plan um, as opposed to going through um, uh, really any number of other options. Um, uh, so are, are you imagining that, that I, I also sorry, um, have long looked for other opportunities for for TLT dollars, uh, really since the establishment, even of Visit McMinnville, um, uh, I've had multiple conversations um, with them about other possible um, uses uh, uses other than just marketing. Um, so it's not the it's not the 
it's not using the dollars to do broader work, which I'm supportive of. It's how we how it's proposed that we get there by ending a contract early um, without a plan, renegotiating, and then bringing in this consulting firm, which will be tremendously expensive. Um, Remy, I'm just curious, at the end of this process, are you imagining that there's not going to be some kind of consulting firm that's going to take a look at the next plan coming forward? I mean, do you think that that's just going to, or are we just going to re-up and not really take another look at it at that point? Because really it's just a question of consulting at one time versus consulting at another, isn't it? No, I don't think that is the question, actually. I think the question is, what is the role of Visit McMinnville? And right now, we've charged them with being solely a marketing organization um, instead of a, a broader um, you know, management organization. We've asked them to do strategic planning that's focused on marketing when we could be asking them to do strategic planning that's um, more broadly uh, focused on best economic impacts for the area. And, and that strategic plan may or may not um, uh, require a, a consulting firm at, at some point, but... Um, uh, it feels like cart before the horse here, in the idea of stopping the work of a major economic driver Excuse and bringing me, in a, you've, a you've repeated the same firm that's, um, I'm sorry. Uh, that could be operating under the, the current board. It, it does not make sense to me. Um, I, I agree that we should be asking ourselves how we can leverage the TLT dollars uh, for the greatest economic development in our area. Um, so it's, this is really based on the, the methodology that, that's can, presented here of can, can the early end of the contract. It, it's not saying that we rubber stamp another contract at all. It's, it's uh, what I'm asking is how do we, um, how do we work with something we've already created instead of instead of destroying that and trying to create something new again, uh, how do we um, ask Visit McMinnville what they can do for us beyond, uh, beyond marketing and um, still within um, the allowed uses of the TLT dollars? Uh, Remy, uh, Sal has a question for you. Actually, I'm, I'm hesitant to put the question to Remy because I'm for, afraid of the, the getting filibustered on the answer, but the... I think that you've made some false statements here, chief of which is that you're saying that we're destroying a relationship or that we're ending funding for a project. Neither of those two things are true. I mean, what, what's being discussed is renegotiating an existing contract ahead of the next fiscal year for the organization. Um, the, that, those conversations are going to need to happen either way. So I feel like you're setting up a false dilemma by making the claim that this is inhibiting their work, preventing their work, or stopping them from doing any work going forward. This is a question of negotiating a contract at the point where we're allowed to negotiate that contract. By the way, not this is not my idea. Uh, but but I, I do think that it's important that we make our decision based on, you know, not overblown rhetoric about, you know, destroying relationships or ending work or anything like that. I just feel like that's a false dilemma that you've set up. So let's get some other input. Um, um, Kelly, would you like to... Well, I personally think Visit Bigmanville has done an outstanding job. Uh, their staff is remarkable, and their board is probably one of the best I've ever served with. <clears throat> I do feel it's brought not only uh, tourism, but it's also brought jobs to the community. Uh, <clears throat> so, and the other <clears throat> portion of doing this is going to be the issue of how these dollars, if they are allocated separately, uh, how it's going to be spent is you're going to have to be very careful. It's going to have to be extremely tourism related. But one thing I do want to say in favor of doing it at this time, 
there's been a lot of back and forth dialogue for the last year in regard to this. And why I think, even though, you know, I think it's preprint here too, but as I think about it, it also provides more certainty for Visit McMinnville. At this point in time, they have this feeling that something's going to happen, but the axe won't fall for another year. Uh, I think it would be better for us all to start working on something that's constructive and give them some certainty in how they're going to be budgeting and how uh, uh, ability to look at opportunities for growth rather than have another year of uncertainty. Because I know it's been it's been difficult in a way. I, they all you know are doing their very very best, and it's seems to me like they shouldn't have to deal with this uncertainty. I mean, if, if the council feels, or the majority of the council feels that something should happen in this area, I think they have a right to uh, participate in this and uh, come up with the best solution altogether. Kelly, if I may point out one, one thing pertaining to timing, and that is that um, the way that our original contract was written said that if we were going to make any changes to any of the automatic one-year extensions, that that would have to be done by December 31st. So that puts pushes this conversation to this point in time um, or, or waiting a, another year, at which point we would potentially be negotiating as we were headed out of contract. Um, that being said, Visit McMinnville's board has a strategic planning session set for next month, January. Obviously, the best time for our board to be able to be very thoughtful uh, about this conversation is in that setting where we have a full day versus, uh, you know, an hour and a half to our board meeting with other things on the agenda. Um, you know, we had only our last board meeting to discuss what this contract negotiation parameters would even look like. And I understand the timing issues involved with that original contract obligation. But um, we have a lot of big things ahead of us at our strategic planning session. Um, you know, I hope that, that you and the mayor, um, Mr. Towery, will all be there with us as as per usual we will. and hear those conversations. Um, but you know, one of the things that we're gonna be looking at is um, is destination development. It's something that we've already begun to do. Um, business recruitment is something that, because there isn't anybody else doing this in the realm of tourism, we've already begun to do. Our role as currently defined is very specific to marketing. And that's the way our bylaws are written. That's the way we were created with the resources we had at the time. That was the, um, the best use of those resources to get the greatest gain for our community. Jeff and Kittry are absolutely outstanding and I cannot say enough how fortunate we are as a community to have leaders of this quality who are leading at a statewide level the conversation and even national level about tourism and, and smart, strategic, impactful tourism development. So we're about to tackle conversations of that nature at our strategic planning meeting that's happening next month, where we're looking at um, how we interact with destination development, how we interact with business recruitment, um, as well as continuing to do the things that we've been doing in the realm of marketing, which have had amazing returns for our community in terms of business recruitment, job creation, um, and overall economic development. So. As we have this discussion this evening, based on that timing, um, I personally view uh, the proposal in front of council as a broad framework within which to start a conversation, less than it is a specific path towards a new conversation. And I hope that given the timing and the discussions that we're going to have in the next month, that we can look at this in the most loose possible way to really have the time and the energy as a board to put our best thinkers, our best knowledge, our, our the studies we've already paid for to look at all of those things together and to do what we've done so well in the past, which is to work together and open dialogue to come up with the best possible path forward for our community. And so I, I guess my request of council is that um, while I know you have a proposal before you this evening that we do view that in broad terms with leeway to have an ongoing conversation that that may take us um, in directions others than those that would be very narrowly defined by by what we're 
discussing this evening. And I would agree with Erin. This is all the decision making we're doing tonight is to just begin a discussion. I really we're not doing anything else. And I agree with you. I see it as a partnership as well. So I appreciate that context. Thank you, Aaron. So Adam, thoughts that you might have and then Zach, and then we'll be go back to Remy. Oh, I mean, with what Aaron just shared and that's pretty much what my thoughts were, um, that I just think that Visit Minnville has done so well that they're ahead of the curve right now. And that's why we are having this conversation a year early and that I don't look to, and I don't believe we as a council look to stop any of the progress you're doing in, in marketing, but an extent there's a, you know, there's other things in the city and that I think there's a substantial marketing budget right now and that as TLT dollars continue to grow, where, where do those growth dollars end up going? It's not how much are we gonna cut the marketing budget. I, I don't look to cut the marketing budget at all. It's just as you continue to do a good job and those that continues to grow, what are we doing with those dollars? That's why I would be in favor of this going forward tonight. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Zach? Uh, I have a my sort of opening statement, my position on the matter, questions for Visit McMinnville and questions of staff. And I'm not gonna be as animated because my fingers are really cold, so I'm gonna warm them up. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for, for, for being here. I, I have no, uh, I have nothing but admiration for the work you and everyone involved in McMinnville, Visit McMinnville has done. It is an excellent, excellent job, and I, I, I wish I was as, half as successful as what you guys are able to do at what you set out to do. And it is with that luxury that we were able to have this conversation tonight. Um, so I, 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 I thank you for that. The growing TLT dollars has, has, like I said, has allowed us to have this conversation, and for me, it's not taking dollars away from, from you guys and your successful ability. To, it is to make sure that some of that 70% comes back into the city of McMill for direct projects um, as what you guys are calling destination development. So is, is in different form than marketing. It's for figuring out a way to spend it in town on real improvements. Um, a couple of questions. Your de destination development, how can you without you know a prepared packet of any information can you tell me how that actually works and gets implemented in in my mind it's let's say it's the improve because it's been thrown around in some of the attorney general things that we've been reading or but like a sewer line how does destination development would do that in my mind i see you know public works goes out or hires a contractor and does it or or builds or improves a road or builds or improves an airport how does how does if, if we charge Visit McMinnville with doing that, how does that work? So I think that that's probably a question better suited to an attorney to um, let you know how the city of McMinnville can spend those dollars on projects that are not directly tourism related. I, I am familiar, I'm, I'm not an attorney clearly, I am familiar with the attorney general um, statement I think that you're referring to. Um, I My read of that, my understanding of that is that um, you can't use those dollars for facilities, even if tourists use them in a substantial way, it's only for facilities that have a primary tourism function, but I'm not an attorney and I'm not here to translate what that looks like. What destination development looks like on a national level, a state level, what it could look like here in McMinnville, those are the conversations that our board needs to have. There are very exciting things that are happening um, around, um, in and around McMinnville that make our destination um, an attractive place for year-round visitors. Um, Jeff Knapp is the absolute authority on these things. Uh, I am not. Um, there are many and ample conversations that have to do with cycling tourism and the ways in which um, you know, cycling trails, et cetera, could potentially be developed and how that could aid an overall um, uh, tourism economy. So destination development 
as I understand it, as though I'm talking about it, doesn't have to do with developing sewers inside your destination. That's something that is up to attorneys to discuss. Um, but it would be looking at um, tourism-based development inside a community. The dollars, as I understand it, again, looking at you, Mr. Gal, I'm not an attorney. The dollars, as I understand it, if spent on any sort of uh, infrastructure, have very specific tourism-related parameters around that. So yeah, I, I get, don't feel I, equipped to answer I, that. I get that we're in for a um, long sword fighting, dueling, horn swoggling battle on what that tourism related facilities means. So I, I think instead of getting bogged down in how, how and what those available funds could go to, um, that's I think that's gonna be a different longer conversation, one that's outlined potentially here. So um, I think my mainly my question that I, I didn't phrase very well was more akin to how do you see that what, what you're calling destination development and how do you define that, which I think you, you hit there. So I, in my mind, I'm, I'm kind of a boring and uncreative so I can't really, I'm having a hard time picturing it, exactly what you mean. Mr. So, it sounds good. <laughs> so there's a, uh, in, in regards to destination de uh, development, this is the national trend, um, not just something that we're making up. It is a trend of, uh, this is what everyone's talking about here. So it is, um, you know, marketing has its benefits and there's a, there's a return to that uh, and we can and we can do that. But it, what we really are doing is developing a, uh, destination to, um, it's where we can impact both visitors and the people that live here and improve the quality of life through things that we do. So for instance, we are abundant in food and beverage. We are a food and beverage destination. We have wine out the wazoo. <laughs> Maybe you've heard of that. I think that's a new advertising wine out the wazoo. Right there. Yeah. So what are the other things that we, what, where are we lacking? What do we don't have that could, um, in, you know, what are the things that we could, that we could build out that would attract people to book another room, another night, stay longer and spend more money in our community, and at the same time could have an impact on people that live here and improve quality of life and uh, make young people wanna stay here. And uh, you know, when they graduate from Linfield, um, work in our community uh, and provide more things to do. So those things right now that you know we're looking at are outdoor recreation opportunities, um, arts and culture, um, agritourism, I mean, there's work you can do with heritage sites. Um, there's all sorts of stuff. So the idea that, and, and we've been doing a lot of that work. I've been doing a lot of that work. So that mon that is coming from my personal focus and time, and that comes through partnerships, comes through working with county and regional um, opportunities, uh, leveraging grants, um, sitting in all of these conversations with the city about urban growth boundaries and facilitating those conversations about opportunity. Um, we've just recently been exploring business recruitment. So there's a lot that we can do in destination development. We can define what that is for us, but we also have a lot of data to support what what would we would recommend right now. So this is a natural uh, direction that we were heading as an organization. Um, and it just happens to coincide with these conversations that we're having right now. So I hope that, in does that answer your question too? It could involve uh, a conference facility or, it, you know, the, it, if there was a tourism based thing that- right, But a, a study that says we need a conference study we or don't. actually start not- I, I do not have one of those. We have one that says we, don't do that. It says don't. Yeah, I, I, I know that that study exists. I've read the study that- Yeah. Uh, so, the, but your your example was about a convention center, so it's not. Dest, your your idea of funding destination development programs in the future of visiting Winville is not more studies about telling us if we need them. It's actually building them. Um, it could be both. I mean, it's a conversation of what 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 is the best use of our time and resources that we have now, and what are we building towards. So it's I don't have a definite answer. It's a scope of work. So. Um, I can tell you right now what we have and what we're working on. We're going to meet as a board strategically, and we're here to have that conversation with you on what the future could look like or should look like. Okay. Okay. Um, that's all my visiting removal questions. Thanks. Uh, staff, uh, can uh, um, so I, I think I, I just need help understanding what the timeline the effects on the timeline that's being asked of us from what you put in here are. I understand that 
July 1st, 2020, a new optional one-year contract will be automatically renewed if, unless we do something to say to the effect otherwise by the December 31st this year. And then at the end of that optional one year in July 1st, 2021, we're talking about with this task force starting about how we renegotiate a new three-year term that starts then. Is that correct? So this signs us up for automatic renewal of the next one-year option, and then we're talking about how we redo the three-year thing that's coming up. So the recommendation that we've put before you is we start the conversation about a new three-year contract, that we don't roll into that final year of the current <laughs> agreement, that we spend the next several months doing some strategic planning and thinking, uh, building what we think a new um, task force would be able to do, uh, figuring out how to incorporate that into the current work that Visit McMinnville already does, and <coughs> initiate a three-year agreement that that begins July 1, 2020. But your, your, you outlined a longer timeline for that task force, if I'm not mistaken? No. The work of that group would consume a portion of the new three-year agreement during which Visit McMinnville will do a, oh. doing a bunch of work, marketing, destination management, business recruitment, whatever it is that evolves out of their work plan. They're going to present a budget and work plan to you next spring, whether you have a new successor agreement for three years or whether you roll the existing agreement for one year. So when they come to you every year with a budget and a work plan right. subject to the council approval. So I understand that. Can I comment on that just a little bit further? Please. Absent any council action to do anything at this juncture, the um, automatic one year renewal will occur next July 1 and will go into the sixth year of a six year agreement in effect. And at the end of that year, the agreement will be terminated, lacking some other renewal. Much like a basketball team that has a star player who's coming close to the end of a term of a contract, it's not unusual to have an early renegotiation for a longer contract that starts sooner rather than later. And so that's, I think, what the city manager has proposed is starting that process and that conversation, but not giving notice of termination of the agreement earlier than it would otherwise terminate, as I understand it. Correct. And as a sports guy, I should have thought of that metaphor myself. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> Thanks for calling us star basketball players. Yeah, we'll, we'll take that. You're a restricted free agent, so the, Jeff. The hope is that we're going to create a framework and onboard that Jul July 1st, 2020. Earlier. If not earlier, for a new three-year agreement. And a new three-year agreement can start at any time. It doesn't have to be related to a fiscal year, but it's logical to do that. From a budgeting From a budgeting standpoint. It, it gives... It, it gives the, it gives Visit McMinnville the opportunity to do their strategic planning. It gives both um, the city and Visit McMinnville the opportunity to build its annual work plans and budget and bring a proposal forward that allows both organizations to move forward together. And this is, I have to explore the process and I don't, and other than trust and faith in trying to make a new three-year agreement that's successful for everybody now, as we've talked about, that's better to know now than wait impending doom. I, that was a salient point. Other than trust and faith in that we both want to do that, which goes a long way. There is no actual incentive based on what Walt said. There's, there's no onus, there's no contract runway other than the three-year agreement when that, that starts again, right? That is the actual. So there's, there's no... Because they have a because Visit McMinnville has a contract until July first, just till the end of June 2021. There's no actual incentive to be done with anything before then, for any reason other than trust and good faith, which we've talked about here, or mutual advantage, or mutual advantage. I, I, I just want to understand that correctly. And I, I guess using that language, I think what we've brought 
before you is a description of how we see that mutual advantage and, and how over the last five years, both the city and Visit McMinnville have learned and evolved in the tourism industry. And it feels like now is the right time to have that conversation sort of, and to start to set those wheels in motion. Okay. So did that bring some clarity? That did bring some clarity. Um, there is some talk, I have one more question. Uh, talk about the potential of bringing a consultant or consulting services. Would that come out of city general fund? Would that come out of, you know, or is it, yeah, whose fund would that come out so of? So describing the work and deciding who pays what is part of the conversation that we have over the next several months informed by Visit McMinnville strategic plan and our ongoing discussions. Okay. So we bring that forward. Okay. So I'll go back to Remy and, um, any any thoughts that you have after that discussion, Remy? Well, yeah, in a way, I mean, uh, I, I actually kind of feel reinforced in my original position. I mean, now we're having this very open conversation, and it seems like, you know, that there's, um, you know, I think, what did they say? Uh, that you know the strategic planning is is coming up and and you know i think there, there's been general consensus on the council that we absolutely do need to be exploring additional uses of tlt dollars and so in a way i i, I mean i i do feel reinforced that um you know, if, if we are now saying this uh, collectively um, and that they kind of have an opportunity to um, uh, address that in their upcoming strategic planning session without um, ushering in these types of uh, changes and, and not... Um, even giving them the opportunity to do that when they have been a, a really good partner. I, I'm, again, it's the methodology here that is bothersome to me and it remains bothersome. So, um, the, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I mean, we, we clearly need uh, organizations that are based on, on broader economic development um, and, uh, so I mean, I would I would be comfortable letting that be the direction that council gives is you know in your in your upcoming strategic planning session, um, show us how you can uh, grow and and evolve before um, contract renewal and uh, and what you can do and what you can recommend for um, broader uses of, of TLP dollars, even if that means shifting um, what it was uh, that you were initially charged with doing. Um, and so uh, that's, that's where I land on it. I, I would prefer to see an organization that's working well continue to do work and have more and a broader um, load put on their plate rather than than shift gears, uh, uh, you know, rather than kind of change horses in midstream. Thank you, Remy. Uh, we've had a good discussion tonight, and so I think we're to a point right now where what we're charged to do is direct staff by either motion or consensus uh, to initiate a negotiation on a successor agreement with Visit McMinnville and we have before us a direction from uh, as staff sees it. So uh, I'm just to a point right now, uh, do we have a, a motion or, uh, and I think I, I'd like to do this by motion and a vote, uh, given that um, I think we, we have some different feelings on both sides. So I'll just ask for a motion and uh, we'll, we'll go through that process. I move that we open a negotiation at this point in time that will possibly result in a new contract as of July 1st, 2020. Second. So we have a motion and a second, a motion by Kelly and a second by Sal. So I'll ask all those in favor of this motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 
Any opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Nay. Okay, we have uh, uh, a four to one in agreement with this. And so the, the, the direction to staff this evening is to move forward. Um, and uh, with, the with the discussions that have happened and coming back with a contract, and then again, giving the opportunity that when the Mc uh, Visit McMinnville board meets, you know now that we're looking at a three-year horizon with some, some input from that perspective. But good discussion. I think we've covered quite a little territory tonight. And again, as has been said, thank you here. Thank you here for all of your, your good work. I mean, to see where we started from and where we are today, um, national recognition in many, in many aspects of the work that's being done. So thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate the ongoing partnership. Look forward to moving forward together. Great. Thank you, thank you. Jeff and <clears throat> Aaron. Okay, uh, we have... Uh, um, uh, we'll call on Amy, I guess, to... Uh, we already did that. Oh, we've already... Okay, we've done that. So, uh, again, a part of your packet is the August and September cash and investment reports. Uh, we're, uh, we have our consent agenda. We have four items on that. Is there any counselor that would like to take anything off the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by Sal, seconded by Kelly. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any, op any opposed? Uh, the consent agenda passes this evening uh, five to zero. We have a first reading of an ordinance, um, and this is ordinance 5083, an ordinance amending ordinance 5018 uh, relating to single use bags. And so um, you have the material in your, your, your packet. Uh, so um, is there anyone that would um, uh, 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 object to having this ordinance read by title only? Hearing none, uh, I'll have uh, Walt read uh, ordinance 5083 by title only. Ordinance number 5083, an ordinance amending ordinance number 5018 relating to single use bags. Thank you. We'll call on uh, Jeff Towery to lead us in a presentation on, on this ordinance. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. During the last uh, legislative session, uh, um, the state legislature passed House Bill 2059, uh, which uh, preempted uh, McMinnville's ordinance 5018, which was adopted in 2017 and amended again in 2018 by ordinance 5050. <laughs> uh, the League of Oregon Cities worked to try to grandfather regulations for cities um, which had already uh, put limitations on plastic bags. That effort was unsuccessful, resulted in the current one-size-fits-all solution for the whole state. Uh, the House bill does allow cities to set penalties, uh, which this ordinance does, consistent with Council's prior actions. Uh, the amendment, uh, the ordinance that's before you uh, will make our rules consistent with that adopted by the state in House Bill 2059. Thank you, Jeff. Um, do we have uh, uh, any discussion? I just have a question, um, Walt. Is is um, if we don't do anything, the state law preempts our ordinance anyway. Correct. Your ordinance will be on the books, but not enforceable. Okay. okay. So it just clarifies, I think, our position what? and brings us in line. This pretty much <laughs> cleans up your municipal code. Got it. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? I will ask for a motion uh, to pass uh, ordinance number 5083 to a second reading. So moved. Second? Second. It's been moved by Zach and seconded by Adam. Um, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we will have um, uh, Ordinance 5083, uh, read by uh, our city attorney uh, by title only. Ordinance number 5083, an ordinance amending ordinance number 5018 relating to single use bags. Okay. Um, 
We'll ask for a motion to adopt ordinance 5083. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by uh, Zach and seconded by Adam. Um, let's ask the city uh, recorder to pull the council. Zach? Aye. Uh, oh. um, Remy? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Sal? Aye. Adam? Aye. And Mayor Scott? Uh, I don't think I vote. Oh, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, after the roll call, Ordinance 5083 is adopted by a vote of five to zero. Uh, and so that is taken care of. Thank you. That takes us to our resolutions this evening. Uh, resolution 2019-65 uh, is a resolution adopting the building fee schedule. And we'll call on uh, Heather and uh, Larry to uh, uh, share with us, uh, make a presentation. You wanna make the presentation? I have no clue what <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to wake Larry up, okay? She. <laughs> <laughs> You're mean. You're mean. <laughs> It's not compliant with the state regulations and we needed to bring a lot more elements into it we added all those individual elements like the dishwasher and installation of a dishwasher and things like that and we had some conversation about it last year what we found as we were going through the process is we had done a full cost recovery and they were all slightly different and it just didn't make sense for anybody in terms of administering that so we've made all those fees the same we've actually reduced several of them um, there was also some discussion about if someone came in with three appliances that they wanted to install would they need to have fees for all three of them independently so no it's built into the fee schedule that the building official can make a call on that and if it's one inspector going out one time to inspect all three we charge one fee for that so we've been having that conversation with the development community on this we anticipated last year when we did the building fee update that it, there would be an increase in building fees anywhere from zero to 15 percent because we brought a lot of additional fees into our schedule that was out of date. And doing the math over the past year, it's been about a three, per, three to six percent increase for most of our building permit fees. We've only had one person who actually visited with us about it, who felt that, um, who was either one confused or felt that they the, the fees were not um, <clears throat> appropriate for what was being, um, for the work that was being performed and that was relative to those appliances and so that's when we came up with the special provision for the building officials say if you go once and you're doing more than one we'll just charge one fee and we did that very early on in the process last year so what you have in front of you is a schedule that um, increases it by the cpi index it also continues to build the reserve we have a, um, a a policy to build a reserve for the building fee program and we will, we will continue to evaluate the fee schedule every year and bring to you what we feel is the full cost recovery for the program what you don't see tonight is a planning fee schedule update if you recall last year when we did the fee schedule update the planning fee schedule was fairly significant in terms of the update um, and at that time last year, you directed staff to maintain that fee schedule until June 30th and, and as of July 1, then increase it by 10% plus CPI. So we'll bring that to you in July. Those will remain the same as they are right now. Thank you, Heather. Uh, any discussion around the dais? Hearing none, then I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2019-65. So moved. And a second? Second. Been moved by uh, Sal and moved by Kelly. All those um, in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 In, any opposed, please signify by saying nay. 
Resolution 2019-65 passes unanimously um, uh, five to zero. It takes us to our second resolution this evening of 2019-66, a resolution authorizing city committee commission appointments. And so Heather, I'll turn to you. Yeah, so this is our annual um, resolution to appoint new volunteers to our city committees or uh, reaffirm uh, committee members whose terms have expired but have applied to be on the committee again. Uh, every year in October, we send out a... Um, we, we advertise in the paper several times the opportunity to um, participate in these committees and, and ask for applications. And then uh, the council president and the mayor and the chair of the committee meet and review the applications, typically interview the candidates and then make a recommendation to you as a full, full body. So that's what you see tonight in terms of the resolutions. There are two positions to be full, filled on the affordable housing task force with their terms expiring December 31, 2022. Um, one is for Alan Rudin, who's a developer builder, and he's he's re that's a reappointment for him. And the other is for Alexandra Hengen, Hengen, I believe that's correct, who is the executive director of YCAP um, as a housing provider. There's also Stephen Leonard uh, for a four-year term to the airport commission, commission as Councillor Garvin explained to you earlier this evening. Uh, we have two positions for the Historic Landmarks Committee, both four-year terms uh, for Mary Beth Branch and for Christopher Knapp. Um, we have two positions for the Landscape Review Committee, uh, three-year terms, Rob Stevenson and John Hall. And then for the Planning Commission, we have uh, one for Ward 2 with Roger Lizett. That would be a reappointment for a four-year term, and we still have two openings on that committee, that commission. Thank you, Heather. Uh, again, um, having an opportunity to meet with all of the candidates, we uh, again show uh, a lot of interest in individuals that want to serve this community. Uh, any discussion around the dais? I know all of the applicants, and they're great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2019-66. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Zach and seconded by Sal. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Resolution 2019-66 passes unanimously 5 to 0. That takes us to our last resolution this evening. That's resolution 2019-67, resolution authorizing the city manage, manager to enter into a contract with clues incorporated through the Houston-Galveston Area Council Cooperative Purchasing Program for the purchase of a new CCTV uh, inspection van and Larry this is where I will call on you and not Heather okay because she wouldn't know what to say but um, to run us through this discussion in front of you refers to uh, the collection crews uh, request to enter into a contract with Q's to purchase a new uh, CCT in, uh, inspection van uh, the current TV van is 22 years old and is due for replacement. Uh, the van's used on a daily basis to assess our city's pipelines to help prevent backups and identify needed repairs. Uh, we engaged with Walt to review the procurement process that we went through and uh, to make sure that we met all of Oregon's procurement requirements. And uh, the funding for this purchase is included in the adopted budget and our staff recommends adopting this resolution approving the purchase of the new van. Thank you, Larry. Any questions of Larry on this purchase? What's gonna to happen to the old van? <laughs> What's gonna to happen to the old van? Uh, Q's has given us the ability to trade it in for 7,000. So oh, that's wow. a potential that we'll look at. Nice. There you go, 7,500 bucks, it's yours. <laughs> oh, hey, now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do is ask for a motion to approve resolution 2019-66. So moved. A second? Second. It's been moved by Zach, seconded by Kelly. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Need any to wait for Joe. Any, <laughs> any opposed, please signify by saying nay. 
Okay, this uh, resolution 2019-67 passes unanimously uh, five to zero. Uh, just for the record, Mayor, Councilor Drabkin is no longer on the line. Okay, so uh, that would take us four to zero. Okay, that uh, concludes our agenda for our regularly scheduled uh, uh, council meeting. So I will close that. And now we will have a short meeting of the city <coughs> council urban renewal agency meeting. And um, I'll go ahead and open. Uh, tonight we have a consent agenda to consider the, mean, the minutes of the meeting of June 25th, 2019 of the Urban Renewal Agency meeting. Um, would anyone like to have anything?